Okay, so um, last time we talked about turbulent flow sort of at a very conceptual level, talking about things like the viscous sublayer and um, you know, how it behaves and how the, the behavior impacts the, um, the heat transfer coefficient, the shear stress. What we're going to start doing today is uh, thinking about it a little bit more rigorously. And uh, the way we're going to do that uh, is with what's called the uh, Reynolds Averaged Equations. So uh, what I'm showing here are our, um, let me get my pointer. These are the uh, equations that we derived, uh, simplified for our boundary layer. So we have our momentum equation um, here, right? This is uh, the X momentum. We have the continuity equation and we have the um, energy equation. I've simplified it by getting rid of the uh, viscous dissipation term. And uh, in the turbulent flow, these equations uh, continue to work. These are unsteady equations, right? In a turbulent flow, you would have an unsteady situation. Um, if you were able to solve these equations at uh, appropriately small time scales and length scales where you could capture all of the turbulent fluctuations and all of the turbulent behavior, um, you know, these would be the equations that you would be solving. Um, those kind of solutions are computationally incredibly difficult. Um, those are called uh, DNS or direct numerical simulation of turbulent flows and at least until recently, those were not things people uh, embarked on unless they had extremely um, good computational resources. So rather than trying to actually physically capture all of the details of the turbulent flow, you know, at, at, the, at the very small time scale and very small length scales that, that you need to do that, what people do is they take these equations uh, and they average them. So instead of trying to capture the actual velocity, which is a function of x and y and time now because we have these turbulent fluctuations, what we're going to try to do is come up with some equations that would capture the average, the time averaged velocity. So that, that averaging process is what's referred to in the Reynolds averaged equation. So average means averaging. So rather than getting the true fluctuating velocity we're going to try to solve, we're going to get a set of equations that govern the time averaged velocity and the time averaged V velocity and the time averaged temperature, right? And those are the Reynolds averaged equations. So um, to do that, we will integrate uh, over time. We'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll come up with a set of equations that look a lot like these equations. Um, but uh, Unfortunately, but I guess not surprisingly, they're not exactly like these equations in that you're going to end up with some additional terms uh, in these two, in the momentum equation and the energy equation, that, that um, stick around after the time averaging, right? And those additional terms are related to the, the additional uh, momentum transport and energy transport that occurs due to the turbulent fluctuations, right? So we don't get off scot-free, right? It's not like we just time average and we get a set of equations that look exactly like our old equations. We get a set of equations that, that look like our old equations, but they have these additional terms that are related to the turbulent fluctuations, right? And so in order to actually come up with a solution to these equations, we have to come up with a model for these additional terms, right? And that's called the turbulence closure problem. So, um, Simpler equations, certainly equations that are much more computationally um, tractable, right? Much more computationally attackable, but you, you also equations that can't be solved unless you have a model for, for how the uh, turbulent fluctuations that occur at all these different time and length scales, how those turbulent fluctuations impact the actual time averaged uh, characteristics of the flow. Okay, so um, just to sort of talk a little bit more about this, this um, picture here is my attempt at drawing the velocity that you might measure as a function of time if you put a probe into the turbulent boundary layer. So we've seen this before. Um, the velocity is, is fluctuating around some average value, and those fluctuations, 
have actually a range of time scales, right? And those are the turbulent time scales. So when we do our Reynolds averaging process, we're going to integrate this velocity over some period of time, T integration, that is much longer than the time scale of the turbulence, tau turbulence, right? So our integration time is going to be substantially longer than these fluctuations so that we can then um, be left with a set of equations that describe U bar, right, rather than a set of equations that we have right now which describe U. So U bar is no longer a function of time, at least if our flow is a steady state flow, right? And by steady state here, I mean steady state in terms of the um, external boundary conditions that are imposed on the flow, right? As long as we're dealing with a flow that has a steady free stream velocity and nothing changing with time, you know, the flow itself in a turbulent flow is going to be unsteady, but um, the average velocity, U bar, will be, will be steady. It won't be changing with time. So um, we're going to be left with a set of equations that describe this U bar, which is only a function of, of where you're at, right? So a function of X and Y and V bar and T bar, rather than what we have now, which are these um, much more complicated differential equations because they describe U, which is a function of X, Y, and T, right? They describe this squiggly line, whereas the equations we're going to get describe this steady state line. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you think about what you might do with a CFD program, at least typically if you use a CFD program and you're modeling turbulent flows, you know, you'll, you'll go through the process of putting in some kind of K-epsilon model or some kind of turbulence model and you'll get a solution. And the solution, when you look at it, will be for a steady state problem, you know, a solution that is completely steady state, right? You'll see a, a velocity distribution that's completely steady state. In your mind, you've got to realize that that's not physical reality, right? The solution you just got is the solution for the averaged U velocity and the averaged V velocity, right? And these, these turbulent fluctuations in reality still exist. It's just that the CFD model is basically solving the Reynolds average equations rather than the actual... Uh, differential equations. And I, I say that knowing that computers are getting better and better and so that, you know, in some cases you might be actually doing direct numerical simulation. All right, so that's what we're going to go ahead and, and do. Um, we're going to express our velocity as the sum of the averaged velocity and then the fluctuating component of that uh, velocity, right? So if you think about what we're doing, we're we're taking this velocity, this u, and we're averaging it, right? So u is the sum of the average, and then we're adding to that average the fluctuating component, which is u prime, right? So we have this average component, and we add to it this fluctuating component, which fluctuates above and below zero, and we get back to u, right? Same thing for v and for t, right? v is gonna be v bar plus v prime, V bar is the steady component, whereas V prime is the fluctuating component of the V velocity. And by the way, the fluctuations in V and in U are about the same. There's not a lot of difference, even though the magnitude of V bar and U bar are quite different, right, because we're in a boundary layer. And we'll do the same thing for T, right? T is going to be equal to T bar plus T prime. So this is kind of our... Um, our process, right? The first thing we'll do is we'll take our equations and we will substitute into those equations uh, these definitions, right? So we're going to express everything in terms of an averaged uh, quantity and then a, a fluctuating quantity. And then we'll actually do the averaging. And what you'll see when you come out the other side is uh, when you average the average quantities, you, you get a very simple answer. And when you average a fluctuating quantity, you get zero at least most of the time, and there'll be a couple of exceptions to that. So that's what the Reynolds averaging process uh, is going to do. All right, so let's practice with the um, continuity equation. So we'll just go through the process. Um, the continuity equation uh, is kind of boring, but at least it, it demonstrates uh, how you go through this process. So like I said, here's the continuity equation. We haven't done any averaging, so this continuity equation actually describes the time-varying U and the time-varying V in all of its glory inside of a, a turbulent boundary layer. Um, 
I don't want that, right? I want a, an equation that describes the uh, time averaged u or u bar and the time averaged v or v bar. So the first thing I'm going to do is take uh, this definition of u, right? So u is equal to u bar, where u bar is the time average value of u plus u prime, which is the fluctuations of u away from that time average value. So I'll take this definition, substitute it into here. So I get d of u bar plus u prime. Same thing for v, right? v is v bar plus v prime. So all I've done is make that uh, substitution here. So I'll break this up into, um, so the next thing I got to do is integrate, right? So I'm going to take this and integrate over time. And remember, the integration period is um, long enough that I'm going to capture, um, you know, plenty of turbulent fluctuations, right? So I'm integrating over a whole bunch of turbulent fluctuations, and that integration time is t integration. So that's what I've done. I'm integrating from 0 to t integration, this equation, uh, with respect to time. And then I'll divide by t integration just so I get back to velocities. Um, so I'm going to break this up then into one, two, three, four separate integrals. Right, so I have the integral of du bar dx, I have the integral of du prime dx, dv bar dx, and dv prime dx. Right? And you're going to see that when we do this, most of these terms fall into one of two buckets. Right? Bucket one is this kind of thing where I am integrating an averaged value. Right? So this averaged value is a function of x and, and y. It's not a function of time, right? Because I've averaged out time. So I can take this uh, averaged value and actually pull it out of the integral with respect to time. So that's what I've done here. So I have 1 over the integration time, du bar dx, and then 0 to, to t integration of dt, which is just the, the integration time, right? So integration time cancels out. And I'm left with du bar dx, right? So the integral of this average quantity over time divided by that time period is just the average quantity. And that should make perfect sense, right? I'm integrating a constant. That's the way you think about this. I'm integrating a constant over time. And of course, I just get that constant times time. So this integral is really boring. It gives you du bar dx, right? Now, this integral is equally boring, but in a different way. So this time I'm integrating a fluctuating component. And this fluctuating component, du prime dx, that's going to be above zero exactly as much as it is below zero, right? It has to be because this is the average value and this is the deviation from the average value. And the deviation from the average value has to be above it and below it by the same amount, right? So if I integrate for long enough, then this integral, this integral right here, has to integrate to zero. Right? So when you're integrating these fluctuating components, you get zero. Right? So when you integrate the average components, you just get the average component. When you integrate the fluctuating component, you get zero. So here's an average component that's going to give me dv bar dy. Here's a fluctuating component that's going to give me zero. So when I do the Reynolds averaging process for the continuity equation, I'm left with the same equation, but now written in terms of u bar and v bar. So it turns out, and this is kind of interesting, I guess, that the continuity equation that governs how the actual time fluctuating velocities behave, it actually governs also how the time averaged velocities behave, right? So this is the Reynolds averaged continuity equation. Okay, so that's our first Reynolds averaged equation. We went from uh, this continuity equation to one that looks exactly the same except for the little bars. So let's work next on the momentum equation, which um, will end up being a little bit more interesting. But uh, <coughs> the process that we're going to use uh, is almost exactly the same. All right, so we're going to now do the same process, but for the momentum equation. Um, before I do the Reynolds averaging process for this equation, we're actually going to um, change it a little bit. We're going to manipulate it so that it looks a little differently. We're actually going to make it look more like it did when we initially derived it. So these two terms right here um, were 
were a little different when we initially derived it. And what we're going to do is put it back into that form. And we do that by uh, basically doing what I think is a pretty non-intuitive math trick. So here's our continuity equation. It says du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is basically just add the continuity equation to the left side of this momentum equation. So here I have um, added to the left side of this equation rho times u times du dx plus dv dy. And so du dx plus dv dy is equal to zero. So I'm just adding zero to the left side of the equation, which of course is, is fine. Um, but what it does is it lets me um, change the form of these derivatives. So if you look at the left side now, I have u du dx, and then here I have another u du dx. So this is 2 times u times du dx, which is actually d of u squared dx. Okay, which is actually the way that this was initially derived. If you look at that, that is the rate of change of the x momentum um, leaving the control volume way back when we derived those equations. And then here I have a u dv dy, and if I add it to a v du dy, so that's what I've done right here, I get uh, d of u times v dx. And again, this actually way back when was the... Um, that should be a dy, I'm sorry, this should be a d of u times v dy. This was the rate of change of the um, x momentum as you went from the bottom surface to the top surface, right? So um, this is the form of the equation that we're actually going to do the Reynolds averaging on, right? And uh, we haven't actually changed the equation at all. This equation and this equation are... Um, are algebraically identical, assuming that the continuity equation holds, right? So this is the one that we're going to use when we do our Reynolds averaging, which is what we'll do next.